Good morning, and welcome to our video devotion for Tuesday, May the 25th, 2021. Seven months till Christmas, so do your shopping early this year. I'm ah, just kidding that. Beginning this morning and for the next three of our video devotions, I want us to spend some time thinking about Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Now, we're not going to go verse by verse through the, ser- through the sermon. Instead, I want us to think about some of the themes that Jesus develops in this message. So let's begin. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 and 22. Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 and 22. Listen to what Jesus says here. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of hell fire. Now notice what Jesus is saying here. It seems that he's equipping, he's, equ- he's equating, that's a hard word to say sometimes in the morning. He's equating some, calling someone a fool with committing murder. Now, that just doesn't make sense. All right, now let's turn, look down at Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 28. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Again, let's think about what Jesus is saying here. Lustful thoughts are the same as committing adultery. Okay. Now let's look down at Matthew chapter 5, verses 29 and 30. If your eye causes you to to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Now let's face it, this is not only confusing, this is kind of extreme. Mutilate your body as an antidote to temptation? Not only is this insane, it doesn't work. All right, let's look at verse 39. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. You know, I am a nonviolent person, but I mean, this is, this is kind of crazy. If someone begins to attack me, I'm supposed to let this person keep on beating me until he decides that he's had enough? That's not only foolish, it's dangerous. All right, let's read on. Matthew 5, verses 43 and 44. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Okay, let's, let's say, imagine for an instant that uh, you had a loved one who had been murdered. According to Jesus, you're, not, you're, not suppo- you're supposed to ignore the instinct, the instinct that you have for justice and revenge. And instead, you're supposed to love and pray for the person who was responsible for your loved one's death. I mean, let's think about it. What, what is going on here? Well, maybe we can begin to unravel this dilemma by looking at what Jesus goes on to say in the 48th verse. Look at what he says here. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, the Greek word that's translated as perfect is teleu. Teleu means the end, the goal, the summit. In other words, your goal in living a godly life is the absolute standard of God Himself. His righteousness, His justice, His love, His holiness, His mercy, His grace, His perfection is the standard you've got to live by. Now, don't just think that this is something unique to the Sermon on the Mount. If you read throughout the Gospels, Jesus never compromised God's standards. He always told it the way it was. So much so that if you allow anger to consume you, you'll be in danger of the fire of hell. 
If you fantasize about a good-looking man or woman on the beach, you're guilty of adultery. If temptation is causing you to sin, gouge out your eyes or cut off your hand. If someone hits you on one cheek, offer them the other cheek as well. If someone commits a sin against you, love them, forgive them, and pray for them. Now, here's the problem with this insistence on perfection. We're human beings, and we don't do that perfection thing very well. Paul talks about this at length in Romans chapter 5, verses 7 through 18. Listen to what he says here. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. With these words, Paul is admitting that Jesus' standard of perfection is impossible to obtain. Not difficult, impossible. So now we've reached one of the fundamental paradoxes of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, do this, but the truth is we can't do it, even if we're saved. So what was Jesus trying to do in the Sermon on the Mount? Was he just toying with us, setting us up for some kind of failure? Or was he trying to teach us a deeper, more important lesson? Well, the place to begin to answer that question is in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. Listen to what Jesus says here. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. You know, Jesus' original audience would have been blown, blown away by this comment. See, here's the thing about the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. They were incredibly vigilant about obeying the law. They competed against one another to see who could be the most scrupulous in obeying the Old Testament law, which meant that not only did they obey the 248 commands and the 365 prohibitions uh, listed in the Old Testament law, they observed more than 1,500 other rules about the law that they created for themselves. It was an all-day affair just trying to be a Pharisee or a teacher of the law. And yet Jesus said, your righteousness has to go beyond that of the Pharisees and teachers of the law, or you'll never see heaven. It was a hopeless cause, even for the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And that's the whole point. See, Jesus doesn't end the sermon on, with, with impossible demands. He ends it with an affirmation of God's absolute love and mercy and grace. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 33, listen to what, what the Bible says here, what Jesus says here. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than, the, than food? and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. And yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If this is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry say, asking, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Do you see the point? that Jesus is making here. He, what he's saying is that God's standard of righteousness is absolute, but so is his love. He is, God is pure in holiness and justice. He demands perfection. 
but God is also perfect in love in tenderness and mercy towards each and every one of His children. You know, Jesus demonstrated this, this quality of God's grace throughout his, his life. He once forgave a terrified woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. He promised eternal life to a convicted felon who was dying on the cross. He even offered a prayer of grace for the people who had arrested, beaten, and crucified Him. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You for this time that we've been able to spend in, in, in Bible study. Father, we, we read these words that Jesus spoke during the Sermon on the Mount, and it's kind of staggering, it's overwhelming, it's beyond our comprehension to be so perfect. But You are. And because You knew that we were sinners who fell far short of Your glory, You sent Jesus to die on the cross for us so that we might be saved through His blood. Father, thank You. We love You. Jesus, thank You. We love You. Holy Spirit, thank You. We love You. We make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope this devotion has been a blessing to you today. I also hope that you'll join me again on Thursday as we continue this meditation on the Sermon on the Mount. Remember, I love you. Uh, be a and you know what? Be, go out and try to be a blessing to someone today. Bye bye.